do, Lord, oh, do remember me. Do, Lord, oh, do, Lord, oh, do remember me. Do, Lord, oh, do, Lord, oh, do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Look away beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. I'm in him. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. Look away beyond the blue. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Look away beyond the blue. I read about it in the book of Revelation, you read it too. I read about it in the book of Revelation, you read it too. I read about it in the book of Revelation, you read it too. Look away beyond the blue. Look away beyond the blue. Look away beyond the blue. Good morning and welcome to our, our topic today is our commitment to Christ. As we look in Luke, the ninth chapter, the 51st verse, this is prior to our lesson. It says, if the time, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus routinely set out for Jerusalem. So Luke records this as though he was on his way to Jerusalem. In Mark chapter 10, verse 10 says, when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus again of certain questions that, that he'd been talking to them about. So there's a little difference. Is he on the road or is he in the house? Doesn't really matter. This deals with the fact that there were children present. And in chapter 10, Mark, beginning with verse 13, it says, People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. They didn't want the kids there. Verse 14 says, when he saw this, he was indignant and he said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And after taking them in his arms, he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. Now, in Matthew, the 21st chapter, verse 15 says this, But when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did, meaning Jesus, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were indignant. Christ was indignant. They were indignant with him. Why? Because he was so popular. 
and the children loved him. Isn't it wonderful being around children? And it's certainly something special to just be able to, to be close to them. See those rosy cheeks and see those big smiles and entertain those interesting questions and record those wonderful remarks that they make. Children are indeed quite wonderful. And Jesus said, we, we have to enter the world, his world, of salvation for the next life after this one. He didn't put it quite that way, but that's what he meant. By training our children. Now, for many years, Roman Catholics believed that they could train children up to a certain age, like five or six, and then they would have them for a lifetime by consistently funneling those things to them. Uh, Adolf Hitler believed that. He said, if you give me kids for a while, they'll be part of the socialist society that I want, that I believe in. Well, he did very well in doing that. And once these folks grasped what they had learned, they put it into action. Jesus wanted the little children to be near him. He wanted them to know that he cared about them, that he would take care of, uh, of them, and that he would love them. Now, being like a little child, hmm, he says, if you're not like a little child, you'll never enter it. Most conversions are made by children. If you grew up in uh, the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, for instance, by the time you're about 12 years old, you would begin going to class to learn about your church and about Jesus. And when you concluded that, you would have Asked, I presume you would say. I don't remember getting a letter grade for it, but that's what it was. And then on one particular Sunday, often in our church, our Methodist church, we would simply do that on Easter Sunday, and there would be a lot of kids come down where we had had training by the minister and by other staff members learning about the laws learning about the directives and the desires of God for us in our life. We learned this as children. Many of us learned this and we took it away with us. Now, sometimes people have a tendency to forget this. I'm concerned about the current generation of children because it's some, the, the focus is truly there. We're trying to get more and more in, but we have more and more youngsters who are proponents of diversity, who uh, are pro, not life, but pro-choice. Uh, no doubt you have some feelings about that. The Bible values life. All life matters to God. As children, we should learn this. And Christ wanted the disciples to let him in. Now, there was no pandemic at the time of Christ as there is today. And they didn't necessarily wear a mask, but they did like separation. And from time to time, Jesus taught them from being out in a boat. Mary Ruth and I were over in Israel two years ago. And we had the opportunity at that time to see the lake where Jesus pulled up in the boat and he talked with the people there. Now, I, I dare say some of the kids could have gotten in the water there. There were rocks out that you could go through and I, I would have been concerned that one of them had fallen over them, but maybe that's only what old folks do. Who do what do I know? Nonetheless, there was spacing there. Jesus did not want spacing when it came to the children. 
Now, enter this, you know, I, I find this word indignant used a lot. And I, I mentioned to you that the chief priest and the teachers were indignant that these children were singing about Jesus in a positive way. And in Mark, the 10th chapter, verse 41, it tells something about the disciples and their being indignant. Ten disciples were indignant with James and John, the two disciples that requested a special favor from Jesus. You remember what it was? They wanted to sit on his right hand and his left hand. Now, Christ didn't grant that. He said it wasn't his to grant. The only God would decide that, and he didn't know who would be because that was up to God. Indignant. Do you ever get indignant? Well, sometimes I get indignant as we watch television. And I see some of the things that are on there today that would have been <laughs> ripped apart in my younger years, especially when television first came out, even the first 10, 15 years. Because there were just things you didn't say and things you didn't do. But today, it's no holes barred. You can pretty well say what you want to. Yes, we do have uh, communications, and they're supposed to sort of police the things. And I guess if they want to, and, they, and you are of their uh, opposition, they'll nail you for doing something wrong. But there's too many wrongs. There's too much bantering back and forth. I enjoy watching an ad that says, here is what I stand for and what I'm go I would do. The majority of these ads are not like that, as you know. They're all negative, putting down the opposite party. And that's a shame. And I show my indignancy by clipping the sound off. So i wait momentarily until that one's off. And then here comes another one. And it's like, okay, it's going to take a while. And I've got, to, what, two more weeks to do this? Okay. So I guess I will. Two, three, whatever it is. I get indignant with that. Perhaps you do too. If not that, then other things. Now, as we continue on in, in the book of Mark, again in chapter 10, verse 17 says this as he was starting out on a journey. Where was he going? He was going to Jerusalem. A man ran up to him. He knelt down before him and he asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, who was this man? Well, Mark 10.10 10 says he was rich. Matthew 19, verse 22 says he was young. Luke chapter 18, verse 18 says he was a ruler. So we have come to know him as the rich young ruler. And he came to Jesus and he knelt down before him. This was not customary for rulers. It was not customary for rich people to bow down before someone, but he did. So it showed you his sincerity. He wanted something from Jesus. What did he want? He wanted Jesus to tell him how he would get eternal life. Can you buy it? Perhaps he thought that. I don't know. Let's see. Jesus said in verse 18, why do you call me Good. That's what Jesus asked him. He went on to say, no one is good but God alone. In verse 19, he said, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud and honor your mother and father. Hmm. These are all people relationship commandments. They're part of the 10. They're on two stones. They're in the Ark of the Covenant, the time of Christ 
And this young man no doubt knew that. He no doubt had studied it because he no doubt went to school. And he just wanted to, to find out, is there something more? So in verse 20, he said to him, meaning to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Hmm. Jesus then said, what? He encouraged this young man and these hearers to lay up for themselves treasures in heaven and indicated their hearts would be there where their treasure was. Now, what did he tell him? He said to go out and sell all that you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Now, obviously, this young man had a great deal of wealth. Well, there was in money, in land, in cattle, wherever, we don't know. But he had a lot. And some have said, the Bible says, that it's harder for a rich man to enter the eye of a needle than a camel. Now, what do I mean by that? That it is difficult to get rid of the, all the possessions you have. Well, friend, we know there are not going to be any U-Hauls, the generals. We know that there's not going to be a whole lot of stuff put in the casket other than our own remains. So why do we make such an extensive effort to retain all that we have? No, I have to chuckle. I'm sure when our children go through the things that Mary and I have, that they will look through some of these things and say, what, what are they doing with this? And it'll easily be discarded or put up on the for sale side, whatever the case may be, because it won't be of any value to them. Now, we valued certain things. I have noticed in succeeding generations that although Meredith and I wanted silver to have special meals with and China to have special meals with, that's not a common thing today. Kids don't want it. Put their money into that. So if whatever, whatever one leaves to that, it's like, well, we don't really want that. We want to use what we have. We'll spend our money on something else. And that's fine. We all have possessions that we like, that we want to keep. Back in my 40s, I realized there were two pocket watches in our family, one on my mother's side, one on my dad's. My brother, my younger brother had one of them and my uncle had the other one. And I thought, you know what? I'm probably never going to have a pocket watch. So I've got my own. And so one day as a reward on an assignment I had, I was paid pretty well for it. I bought myself a beautiful gold watch and I had a gold chain to go with it and during my football years of coaching someone had given me a gold rim with football on it and a little tag said coach and so I put it on the other end and <laughs> until I retired I had about a dozen three-piece suits and so you would see me with my coat off and my vest on and my pocket watch. Now, I guess probably 20 years after that, when I stopped wearing it, it was one day I gave it to our son, Greg. And I said, you know, uh, you can hold this for Josh if you want to. Chances are, I don't think he'll want to sell it because people don't use pocket watches anymore. But in my day, Many did. And the day before, it was very common to have a pocket watch. 
And in fact, some of the pants, even today, they've got a little slot there on the right hand side of your, uh, your, of your pants pocket where you put your watch. That's what it was created for. Now, the next generation probably won't want that. The rich young man wanted to know if he could get a guarantee from Christ on entering the kingdom of God after his life ended. Now, we say he was a young man. Now, what does that mean? Jewish people are different than Gentiles. We're Gentiles. Uh, the Judaism, Jewish religion, is different from Roman Catholics, from Evangelicals, from Methodists and Presbyterians and so and other type of Protestants in that Jews don't have teenagers. They don't have them. They don't worry about them. Golly, those of you that raised teenagers, wouldn't you say that would be wonderful not to have teenagers? Let me just skip through that. Well, this is how they do it. At a certain age, the Jews have a bar mitzvah for a young man and a bat mitzvah for a young woman. Now, don't ask me to explain what the bat mitzvah is. I'm not going to go there. I, I could say something, but I'm not going to. What this means, though, is that you're no longer a child. When that occurs, and usually this is into the teens, you're starting here at 13, and you become a man, a young man. Now, was this young man a teenager 13? I don't know. We can suspect that based on what was said about him by three of the Gospels, that he probably was a teenager. He may well have been in advance of 13. Now, you think back to your days when you were 13 years old, if you go, some of you are gonna have to go way back there in the back of your mind and see what you can remember. Did you study your Sunday school lessons? Did you read the Bible? If you had King James Version like I did, a lot of what I read, I did not understand. And I would hear pastors when I was a little boy talk about carnal and, and what is that? I didn't know what it was. In fact, I used a lot of terms I didn't understand. Today, I have gradually you rasp some of that. And it's important that we continue to improve our own selves, just as Christ directed us, and read the Bible a lot. And we need to. The Bible is the biggest selling book in the world, year after year after year. Now, what is the usage of the Bible? That's another question. We've got a bookshelf behind me here. Got a bunch of Bibles on it, different ones. Uh, currently, I may not use many of those. I still have my J.B. Phillips New Testament written in the 60s. But this is the NIV that I use right now. It's suitable for me. And if I follow a Sunday school lesson written on ESV or something else, Normally, I will make sure to either use that exclusively or use what I've got in the Bible in the market to get to reference places. We need to study this Bible, and every time I read through it, I find out things I never knew before. Sometimes I hear this ministers, or a minister this past Sunday was talking about David and his first wife, Saul's daughter. How she just didn't like David, and she stayed in. Well, and usually she had bowled him out pretty bad because he he danced in the street the way she was telling. He must have been in his underwear, I guess. Uh, and Bible doesn't say that specifically, but one got that idea. But that's the only reference I've ever read. Now, somewhere, someone has obviously decided there were other things and may have reported them. I just didn't see them. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is. We need to do things with our children. Now, the children sang Hosanna. 
to the son of David. That was their way of putting Christ in a very, very special place. Because Jesus is the only way to get in heaven. I don't care what any of these preachers tell you that's different than that. You can follow the New Age movement if you want to, and you can join Ted Turner and his bunch. They think <laughs> you do good things, you'll get there. Well, that ain't true. No way. Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And that is factual. Our Heavenly Father, we are again grateful to have this opportunity to mumble and stumble over a few words. We just pray that you will be with each one of us as we continue this particular, rather interesting and challenging period in our lives that is different than any other lives that ever lived in the world and your creation. Help us that we may soon see some resolution to this. Help us that we might study more of your word and get comfortable with it and help us to reach out to others who may be in need, Lord. Some may, in, may be in need of a, of a verbal pat on the back. Help us to do that with telephone if necessary. Help us to continue to respond to the needs of others in any and every way that we can, certainly with our money. We don't have to be rich, but we do have to follow you, and we need to look to you for guidance. And my prayer to you today is that you will convict each one of us and give us the direction we know in our minds and in our hearts to do the things that you want us to do. It's been a pleasure being with you today. We will continue this series next Sunday. And I look forward to seeing you then.